to get their books out in the world. They can do everything themselves. Amazon has made it easy and there's other organizations that can help you with that too. But if they want those books to be well received, they need the help of a professional editor, not just their cousin who taught high school English. Has your life, your dreams been interrupted? Good news. It is possible to reinvent our lives. People are doing it every day, and some are brave enough to share the struggles, disappointments, and challenges. If you are looking for a new beginning, a do-over, or to rediscover your passion, maybe even find a new one, then grab a cup of coffee and let's talk. Interrupted, Act 2, Reinventing Your Legacy, with your host, Coach Lori. Lynn Pearson has an editing company called All That Editing. She's she's an editor, of course. She is also a writer of fun, flirty, feel-good fiction that simmers at a low heat. And <laughs> her pen name there is Lynn Hancock. Welcome. Thank you. We always start with what your life is like now. And it sounds like you've just kind of jumped into the writing part. Is that new for you? Or? That's fairly recent for me. Yes. I've been a freelance editor for almost seven years. And my business name is called All That Editing, which is really great when people are looking for things in alphabetical order. I hadn't thought about that at the beginning, but it's worked out as a perk. My clients are independent authors, some of whom have published more than 20 books. And the majority write romance, which is great because I adore helping heroes reach their happily ever afters. Many of my friends are retiring, but I really can't see myself doing that. It's very satisfying helping a writer make their story stronger. And I worked recently with a woman who'd made so many changes to her book that it was just driving her crazy. So I suggested building up a small underlying thread about making amends and reconciling relationships. And when I was done explaining to her why she would do that and how she would accomplish the changes, she was almost in tears. She just told me that she loved her book again. And that is incredibly satisfying for me. The idea of starting my own business in my 50s came out of the blue. I had read an author's newsletter that contained a chapter from her work in progress. And I found things that were wrong with it. Not not just typos, but historical references that wouldn't have worked with the story's premise. And I had no idea how to reach out to this woman. And I thought about contacting her publisher and offering my services as a critical reader. And then it hit me. I was like, I was walking through the parking lot to my car where I worked and it hit me. I really wanted to be an editor. So I enrolled in a program at the University of Washington and relearned all the grammar and rules about sentence structure that I'd forgotten over the years. The scariest thing for me was quitting my day job. I worked in the library of a middle school, which I absolutely loved. But when the pandemic hit, I was done. And so my husband and I crunched the numbers and saying goodbye to that steady paycheck was hard work. Hard, but work was coming in at a steady rate. So I felt pretty confident about it. To get a book traditionally published is a long, tedious process. And writers recognize that they don't have to go that route to get their books out in the world. They can do everything themselves. Amazon has made it easy and there's other organizations that can help you with that too. But if they want those books to be well received, they need the help of a professional editor, not just their cousin who taught high school English. To fully appreciate the work involved in taking a story from once upon a time to they lived happily ever after, I decided that I needed to write my own book and go through the whole editing process. Because what happens is, is that the story that is in a writer's head often doesn't make it onto the page. They think they've given a satisfactory explanation for why a character does what they do, but it's often muddy. And that's what happened to me. And I couldn't see it until my editor pointed it out to me. So that experience has made me a better editor. I'm honest in my feedback, but I'm not brutal. I'm much more empathetic. I know what it's like to labor over a scene and then be told that you should cut it because it doesn't drive the story forward. So that particular book that I worked on is shoved in a drawer. Nobody's ever going to see it, but it opened the door for me to allow all those story ideas that were living in my head to come out. So I turned 60 last year and decided that it was time to release some of those stories into the world. And so in 2023, I published three books. And if all goes well, I will publish two more in 2024. I know people who have monetized their hobbies with varying degrees of success. 
And while my business arose from something I enjoy, books and storytelling, the real satisfaction in my work is seeing my clients succeed. It's not work when you love what you do. I love that you're you're like, I'm not going to retire. I'm going to keep Why doing what you? I love. I love that because I talk to so many people in our age range now, and they have so much fear around retiring. And I'm like, but you can still do something you love. You don't have to actually like just stop everything. Mm -hmm. When you made that shift from your job to your business, can you talk about that and the fear behind it and what kept you on track? I had my day job going, which again was working in a library, which is just the best place in the world to be. Then I had hung out my shingle and I was getting in jobs. And so I'd work during the day, I'd come home and I'd work at night. That was fine. It was going okay. But there was something about during when the pandemic hit and people were confined to their homes, there was a lot of them, their muse just escaped. And so I was getting jobs coming like this. Also, there were other people that their muse just took the bus out of town and they didn't have any ideas. It just was a huge mind shift. So I had this work coming in. I think I can do this without the day job. That was hard. It was really, really hard because it's like, what what if it, so many what ifs, it's a scary thing, but it's like, sometimes you have to take a leap of faith. So we did. And I had the backing of my family. (laughs) My son is my tech support, even though he doesn't particularly want too. And it's just great. I love it. I love people that are brave enough to make those leaps because how often do we hear of people in hospice and their regret isn't what they did. It's what they didn't do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another thing I want to address is I teach podcasting publishing. Now I don't teach writing. I teach publishing. And one of the things my non-negotiable is an editor. Because what we see in self-publishing is people rely on their cousin or their aunt. Or I always say an editor is a not only going to punctuation, anybody can do that. But not only that, they're going to know about historical references. They're going to keep you from getting sued because you say something that's actually trademarked. And they're going to help you with your thoughts. So when I wrote my book... I had a great editor. So it went from me who is not, I'm an author, but not a writer. I wasn't like, oh, we walked down the street and we saw the beautiful flowers. I'm like, well, we went to the store and then we did this. And then, you know, because mine's more of a self-help. But what happened is the editor came in and he made it sing. An editor is a non-negotiable if you have this inkling to write. And it's hard to hand it over to an editor. Oh, but- yeah. It is so worth it. So do you want to say more about that? I had a writer who who self-published. He put his book up and he and I met through Instagram of all places. He was tinkering on something or rather and he posted a blurb and I looked at that and I'm like, oh no, that could be so much better. And so I reached out to him and I said, I think you could do this better if you did yada, yada, yada. He and I started to have a friendship and then he says, you know, I self-published this book, but I think that it could be done better if I had a professional editor do it, would you do it? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. When I got finished with that process, he's like, oh shoot, I wish I had done this the first time. And that's one of the problems. It is very, very easy to put a book out into the world, but if you don't do it well, the criticism is just going to hurt you. And you know that old phrase, you only have one chance to make a first impression. And if that's your first book, You're hooped. Yeah, it's really, really worthwhile to find somebody. I may not be the perfect editor for everybody, but find somebody that you can work with, somebody that you can have a back and forth with. Not everything that I suggest works well with the writer, but hopefully my suggestions are a jumping off point. I might tell them that you've got this minor character who really could embellish your story if you did this. And they might go, okay, I can see that, but I don't want them to do this. I think they could do that. And I'm like, go for it have a wonderful time. And it gives them the chance to brainstorm with you. Again, so my two non-negotiables, one is an editor and one is cover art. Because again, and I did use my niece, but she was a professional graphic artist. When we improvise in those two areas, like you say, it could be the difference between something that is, you know, a great seller and a dud. There's two different people that personally I met that published their own book without an editor. And one of them had so many spelling mistakes. And I thought, oh, it's so sad because that reflects back. And Mm -hmm. the other one had this mindset. 
of I'm telling my story in my voice. But what happens is when you do that, think about our voice has a lot of ums and ahs and you guys and things that really aren't appropriate. So when we have that mindset, it's my voice, we let those things pass and those are offensive to listeners. And so that's why to me, it's a non-negotiable to get eyes on it to help you. And then when it, when it's done, you have a whole bunch more confidence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And unfortunately, I know writers who have had their books traditionally published, but the editing was poorly done as well. Even if you decide that you want to go through the traditional route and submit it to HarperCollins or Penguin Random House, whoever it is, it behooves you to have it edited professionally first, because if you get with the small press, they might just take it and going, oh, we're just going to look through it for typos. And there we go. And I've seen that happen and it's not good. Thank you for shedding light on that because I'm very passionate about that. I would look around. You can find editors through a couple of different organizations, the Editorial Freelancers Association, the Northwest Editing Guild. And the first one, it may not be the best one for you, but... If you do have a good experience with an editor, I would say try to keep them because if you're writing a series, you want that person to be familiar with the series so that they don't make too many suggestions based on your second or third book that goes, no, 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 that doesn't work well with what happened back here. So try to develop a relationship is what I would say. Tell us about your books. Are they a series or are they standalones? They live in the same world. The first book is called Grand Gestures. And it is two sisters who have an event planning business in the Seattle area. And they're trying to move up the the rung. And then there's a, a, a minor character that you meet in Grand Gestures. And she's just, she's not a nice person. She's wicked. She's just a total hose bag. And I thought that she deserved a redemption story. So she got the second book, which is called Fraudulent Trust. And she is a trust fund baby who has to be self-supporting by the time she's 35 or she will lose her trust fund completely. And so, so that was her story. And there's a, two minor characters that we meet in that book. And when they showed up on the page, I'm like, Oh, I like you. Oh. I think you two deserve your own book. So they have a story that came out in November and it's called Holiday Headaches. And it's about a woman and a man. They're just acquaintances, but they wind up sharing an apartment together and they become the managers of the building. And it's full of these very cranky, interesting elderly women who just are too meddlesome for words. I love it. And how did that feel for you to go from the editor to the writer? It was hard. Writing and editing are two different things because I get, I get caught up in my own stories and I think they're perfect. Fortunately, my editor is very hard nosed and she will say, this isn't going to work because of this. This isn't going to work because of this. And then I'll look at it and I'll cry. Then I put on my big girl panties and I get down to work and I take care of business. For me, when I originally started writing, I'd have this right cute little idea about their opening scene. I'd write that. And then I wouldn't know what I was doing. And then I clued into the fact, this is something that you hear all the time, is that you really need some kind of a roadmap, an outline. It can be incredibly basic. The idea that I want to drive from Seattle to Portland. That's it. That's my beginning. Oh, and I'll have lunch in Chehalis. Great. That's my beginning, my middle, and the end. But then when I get on the road, I may decide that, hang on for a second. I really want to detour and go over here. And you can do that. And that's the same way when you're writing a book. You should have some form of an outline that you know that you're starting from here and you're ending over here. Coach Lori here. I am not anti-aging. I am all about aging gracefully. Did you know we stop making collagen at a certain age? And did you know powdered collagen has to go through your whole digestive system? So I am a big fan of Glow Liquid Collagen. It helps me age gracefully, inside and out. To order, check the link below. By the way, if you order two at the same time, free shipping. Or if you would like to be an affiliate, make a little extra cash, click the affiliate link. And that's the same way when you're writing a book. You should have some form of an outline that you know that you're starting from here and you're ending over here. And what are the things that are happening in the middle? And you can deviate. Sometimes that's the fun. But you need to know where you're going before you can get there. Otherwise, the stories just don't get off the page. And I love how you said before you were a librarian, which 
people who love books. It's an awesome job. But now you've stepped almost fuller into the thing that you love. So what would you say is the most rewarding part about your life right now? I think the rewarding part is seeing my writers succeed. And I follow them. I'll look to see how well their sales are doing and I will read reviews. And it really makes me happy when I can see someone say, oh, this was such a great book. I can't wait for the next one or or whatever it is. And if they come back to me for future work, that makes me happy too. I deliberately chose to work with romance writers because if you are writing a memoir, Generally, people are only have one memoirs in them. And I've done a few memoirs. I have a nice relationship with this person, and then I may never see them again. But people who write fiction, and if they write genre fiction, they have more than one book in them. So then I create a relationship with that writer. Hopefully, they will come back to me for return work. And when they do, that makes me happy. This is what I keep hearing, especially with authors, is they create a person, a character, and then that character starts to determine and talk to them. Oh, they live in your head and they do all kinds of weird things. And I was working with a writer once and I said, how's it going with such and such? He says, oh, and I just found out he's gay. I'm like, really? You didn't know that? No, it just jumped out at me. His own character. His own character. He didn't know that. So I thought that was interesting. And I think that happens to me as well. I think my character is going to be this this mild-mannered person. And then suddenly they stand up for themselves. It's like, oh, that's a very good idea. I'm glad that you did that. Well, what is it that you really want people to know? I want people to know that you can do it. Is it scary to try something new? Absolutely. But if you don't, if you hold yourself back, where's the fun in that? I could have left, retired from from my day job, sat around the house watching soap operas, or in my case, I probably would have sat around reading and that, but that wouldn't be any fun whatsoever. I like being productive. I like helping other people and books are my happy place. So it was a natural, warm thing for me to do is to combine the two. The beauty is, is that, yeah, I'm in my sixties, but I can do all kinds of things. And I'm going to. A friend sent me this quote this morning by someone called Raven Wolf. It's never too late to reinvent yourself. Start a new career at 40. Fall in love at 50. Learn to dance at 60. Start a whole new life at 70. Stop saying you can't. You can. And you should. Dreams don't have an expiration date. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so funny because sometimes I'll be on a social media post where I'll be talking to a younger person, they think, oh, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And they're in their 30s. I'm like, oh, honey. Oh, no, 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 no. You've got a whole life ahead of you. You have no idea what's around the corner for you. And you should greet it with anticipation, not be afraid. One of the things I love about teaching podcasting publishing is how important our story matters. And I've worked with a lot of people in recovery. They don't want to tell their story because they were in jail or they were they stole things or whatever, or they lost their children. But what happens is when they share their story or they speak their truth, other people go, oh my goodness, there's hope for me. Yes. And I am I imagine even in fiction, a lot of the real story is coming through. Sure, sure. From different areas. You can learn a lot from fiction. You can learn the history of the people. My second book, one of the characters is, I say First Nations because I'm Canadian, but down here we usually say Indigenous. And so I incorporated a lot of the history of the land appropriation that happened in and around the Seattle area. And it was fascinating to research it. What was interesting is how many people who've grown around this, up around this area, and they don't know that because the victors write our history. And so oppressed people's stories don't necessarily get out into the mainstream. So when you have an opportunity to incorporate something like that in a book, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, it's a great thing to do. I love that. So what are you reading? I am revisiting a feel-good Christmas story. It's called The Christmas Fix. It's by one of my favorite authors, Lucy Score. I write what I like. I read what I like. I want stories that make me feel good. So that's where I generally turn to. I just finished Slow Horses. It's a series. And the main character is just awful. He's not just like an old curmudgeon. He's just awful. And yet I find myself (laughs) pulling for him and I just, I don't even know what's happening to me. And that was the fun thing when I was writing Fraudulent Trust. 
Delia shows up in the first book, Grand Gestures, and she's not a nice person. She's just looks at everybody as if they're the help and treats them poorly. And she's so vapid. But there's something about that that I just thought that if you can take a, a character that is unlikable and make them so that you root for them, then you've done your job. And it's really interesting because when I looked at some of the reviews for Fraudulent Trust, a lot of them started out with, I didn't like Delia, but so that was a cool thing. It was a really nice thing to be able to do. To redeem her. One book I just finished was The Last Garden in England. Mm -hmm. It's by Julia Kelly. Same thing. There's a woman in there that she's just not nice, but then little glimpses of redemption. And I love that. And as I was reading through it, I thought that's where the hope lies. Yeah. Is sometimes there's these characters that you want to hate, but when you can find a way that you're cheering for them, it kind of brings it inside. Like all of a sudden it's those characters aren't out there. They're kind of in you and you're like, Hey, I'm rooting for her. What is going on here? I love it when authors can create characters like that. We expect female characters to be soft and to be warm and to have a big heart. But I think there's a lot more interest when you've got a character who's got a tough shell. They're hard to get into. I think that everybody projects something to the world and what you have inside of you is not necessarily the same thing as what's on the outside. So I think that when you create a character who has that tough exterior, it's much more fun to go inside it than when you have this soft, fuzzy character who's just, this is who I am and I want the world to be a better place. Sometimes my characters are a little on the rough side. I love it. I love complicated, but I don't like it when people say that it's complicated, <laughs> but I do like it when it is and there's twists and unexpected. If somebody wants to find your books, where do mm-hmm. they find them? You can find me online through Apple, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, Kindle, on all of the big ebook platforms. And if you want print copies, you can get those through Amazon. And if they still have some in stock, the Edmonds Bookshop carries my books. Oh, how nice. And it's Lynn, L-Y-N-N-E. L-Y-N-N-E. Hancock. Hancock Pearson. And if we want to find you as an editor... How do we You can you? find me at allthatediting.com. Awesome. What I really love and what's really important to me is A, that people see that there is something else they can do and they're brave mm-hmm. enough to take mm-hmm. to take the stand, even though it's scary. Then to see that, oh, I love the life I'm in right now. Mm-hmm. Because we're in 50s, 60s, we're in this transition. And what I feel like I'm experiencing is so much fear with people I talk to. Just yesterday, I was talking to a friend and she doesn't own a home. And she's mm-hmm. like, well, when I retire and I don't know, and nobody will ever accept me because I don't have this kind of bank account. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We can't go by that. We have yeah. to we have to not live in this fear, but it's very real. It's funny because when I decided that I wanted to do editing, One of my friends looks at me and says, that's not very creative. I think it's very creative. And and the thing is, what I like is that I'm working with somebody else and helping them. That gives me a lot of satisfaction. I do something for somebody without cost every year. And sometimes it's things that I've done for my church. Sometimes it's it's for somebody I know who just can't afford for me to do it. But just something I can do. And also, you know, I'll teach classes. I worked with a group of middle school kids who were writing their own books. But of course, they just think that everything they write is golden and that there's nothing that could be better. And it's like, all right, sweetheart, I'm just going to let you go. You'll be just fine. So you mentioned your church. You said you write flirty, feel good, uh, feel good fiction that simmers at a low heat. Yeah. Um, and I, when we talked with Christina Braver, that was kind of like, how does your church, how do Christians receive this? Have you had any good things or a- awkward things with that? Not any awkward. <laughs> Although I did have one friend say to me, he says, are your books like Christina's? <laughs> I said, no, <laughs> mine are a lot softer. Okay. My wife reads Christina's, but I can't read hers. <laughs> That's funny. The feedback that I've gotten from people my ch- in my church has, has been just, they like them. They like them and they can't wait for the next one. So I'm happy to hear that. I love it. So this is one of the things that I did is when it was just October of 2020, and I'd been at a writing conference that was all online. It was supposed to have been an in-person conference, but of course, so it was switched to online. And somebody in the group had said, 
Um, I'm going to do a meetup Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays in the morning. Does anybody else want to do that with me on Zoom? So I joined up and there's, if everybody shows up, I think there's seven of us and we meet for an hour three mornings a week. And that I think has been the best thing for me to keep my writing consistent because I have these people expecting me to be there and we don't critique each other's work every now and then we will help each other. Someone might be in a sticky situation and say, my character is up on the cliff and I don't know how to get him down. And we'll give you a parachute, an eagle comes by and picks him up, whatever the heck it is. But it's just nice to be able to be with other people in their boats. And and we don't all write the same kind of things. Some people write nonfiction. Some people write big, expansive historicals. But it's just nice to be with other people in the same boat. I love that. Do you have brain fog? Are you exhausted all the time? Do you struggle with depression? How about cravings? Imagine an enzyme that turns sugar into fiber. For a link to order your bottle, email me at lacoach at comcast.net. That's L-A-C-O-A-C-H at comcast.net. Three things we learned from Lynn. One, always get an editor. Two, redeeming bad characters is fun. And even if you write fiction, you can bring truth and history to the world. If you love this podcast, here's a big ask. Will you share with your friends and family? Subscribe, give us a review, and a five-star rating so that others looking to reinvent their lives will be able to get the help they're looking for. Thank you in advance.